Hello and welcome to Code with JV, AI snapshot number 15. Hope you've had a lovely start to the year, a nice long break, but AI progress stops for no one, so let's jump into what is new. As always, I'll put the least technical stuff at the front and I'll put the more technical stuff at the back. New York Times is suing OpenAI. A lot of headlines about this and my main suggestion is give it a little bit of attention, but not too much. People are going to be milking this for headlines for ages. Essentially, they claim OpenAI infringed their copyright. I'll include this link below, but here's a bunch of people who are on New York Times' side and essentially, well, they've made a lot of arguments, but one of them is that Spotify has to license this material, Netflix has to license their stuff. They reckon OpenAI should license people's proprietary information if they're using it. And they've got a whole bunch of points in there you can read if you like. OpenAI have put out this blog post yesterday and their main points are along the lines of training is fair use under copyright, and this regurgitation, which is a key part of the, the lawsuit, which is New York Times was able to get whole transcripts back out of copyrighted information. And Open AI is calling that regurgitation. They reckon it's a bug. They're going to get to zero. And they're grumpy at the New York Times. But you can read that if you're interested. My main takeaway on this is that it's kind of noise. There's a lot of research about small amounts of good data giving great models. And if you look at FI2 and the stuff people are doing with smaller amounts of high quality data, they're producing really good outcomes. So even if New York Times wins and no more using copyrighted material to train the models, everyone gets in trouble, I don't think it'll kill the field. I think it'll slow it down a little bit. And whether the courts say training is fair use or not, I think it's an interesting legal question. And we'll find out when they make their decision and then there's not much use wondering about it before then. Chat and AI have also announced a team plan. So I brought on a new team member yesterday and we had to go and sign up a personal account with a company card and then they do this the day after. Okay, now we just have to switch it over. But if you want to manage lots of people's accounts, you can do so easier now, which is nice to have. They've also launched their GPTs marketplace. I think they've had something like 3 million GPTs created since the demo in November last year. The marketplace is live today. They're doing a revenue sharing thing with people who get popular on it. Will anyone make money? Who knows? They might be very generous and probably scale it down over time. But I do think GPTs are interesting and useful things to build, but a lot better than the OpenAI plugins were. It's limited to people with a paid account. So they're using this as one of the big get money out of people things. Is it worth signing up for? Maybe. I do think that they're useful. I've written a bunch. I use a bunch. And the main thing that makes them useful is that they're not just a saved prompt. They are. They can talk to APIs and do things for you. And here's one which is funny. It's built by this developer. I think you'd say Reuven. Not sure, but highly recommend you follow him. And the link to the LinkedIn is below. Does a lot of interesting stuff. But he built this GPT in five minutes, and it's using the Bland AI API, which is AI-powered phone calls through an API. You tell it what you want it to have a phone call about. It will have it and give you a transcript of it. So yeah, that's getting easier and maybe you don't pick up your phone as much anymore, but he's integrated that with a GPT. So I tried this the other day and it worked pretty well. He has to keep putting in credits to make this work because it's burning through things, but it was getting popular, so it might not work now. So what it's doing is it is now talking to the API. As a user, you have to confirm it's allowed to. And as a developer, he's put his API key into a part of the GPT. It's not in the system prompt, so you can't rate it for it. You know, open AI, um, keep it out that way but it's asking me if I'm allowed to talk to the API. And now it's talking to it. It sent it the payload. Wonder if he's got any credits left. Nope, there's my phone. Oh. I'd like to make a reservation for two people next Thursday at 7 p.m. under the name JV. Uh, yep, we can do that. Are there any dietary requirements? Great, thank you. Can you confirm the reservation for me? Yep, it's 7 p.m. next Thursday. Thank you so Am much I talking? for your help. Excuse me? Am I talking to an AI? And it hung up on me. I heard a bunch of people saying, it'll talk to you about, it'll say it's an AI. And then you can go ask it stuff about like thermodynamics and whatnot, and it'll start to respond in a way. You can start to do that kind of thing with GPTs now, which is why I say, I expect them to become interesting. I expect those developers start to integrate them into a whole world of APIs. You can start to have quite a lot of interesting automations for custom GPTs. I think you can get the transcript from this one and it's gonna hit the API again and get it back and whatnot. So there's a, yep. still wants to talk to it. So GPTs, I think they're somewhat interesting. These went live. This is real time now, like today. So I think their servers are under load. That was slow until, oh, okay, we got some things. Am I talking to an AI and a cool buy? Didn't own up GPTs, but Riven does a lot of cool stuff. I recommend you check it out. And also down here, he posted in the comments a link to the instructions he did and how he made all that work. Voice things. There's a lot of voice stuff coming out at the moment. So Open Voice, hadn't heard about this group before, but you can get into their Discord. They put out a research paper last couple of days and it is 
tone color, voice style, like a lot of the more advanced features, which you can usually only get through the paid APIs like Eleven Labs. All right, game face on. Oh, come on. Famous computer game character, someone said. With every brushstroke, the artist poured their soul onto the canvas. You can play the demo if you want to check a bunch of it out. But I think it's really interesting that as the technology increases and you can start to do really accurate voice cloning, really accurate coloring, you start to get AIs calling phones. I think it's going to have a cultural impact on how many people answer their phones. Like the robot dialers and whatnot is just this tech being deployed is going to have a lot of interesting implication. Here's another one, theme from Poly AI. And again, you can play with the demo if you're interested, but 16 kilohertz, phone call applications. People are building a lot of tech for this domain. Unfortunately, one of my favorite voice uh, companies just shut down, Koki. They do the TTS library, which I'm a big fan of. And again, could make the business work. So unsure of the details of it, but appreciate all the work they've done and wish the team all the best moving forward. You may have heard about Mistral's mix of experts. One of the only known mix of experts models is GPT-4. And this was the first open model to use the same architecture where it's got lots of experts talking to each other internally. And they released this December 11, 32K tokens, multiple languages. It is now the default model in Hugging Fat Chat. And so it is a very capable model. It can run on a lot of consumer hardware. This is Mistral 7B, so it's not Mextral, but they put it on an iPhone. So you can have a local model on your phone. And if you think about local model on your phone, local voice generation on your phone, calling out, yeah, you'll be able to have an AI run your phone without using any cloud services. And I think we're going to see a lot of stuff on the phones this year. Google Gemini has made a phone version of it. You're seeing the phones coming out with acceleration chips, which are starting to do some interesting things. So I think this is going to be one of the bigger trends of 2024 is local LLMs or local AI models on phones. Let's have a look at a few more technical things. LangChain 0.1 is out. So I won't go through it in detail. If you want a detailed overview, let me know. I might do a deep dive on it. And this is out. So if you're building on LangChain, check out the newest version. Phi 2, so Microsoft's model, which was 2.7 billion parameters released last year, very performant. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I was saying before that it's small amounts of high quality data which made Phi2 possible and made it so small. And I think there's a lot of people working on making smaller capable models. They're really refining the data that sits there, that they use and being very precise with that. But they're now MIT licensed, so completely free and open to use. Ada, my favorite coding assistant. So Paul Trooper, he just keeps shipping features and he's been doing GPT Turbo is integrated. There's a new format, an editor format called UDIF. And I integrated GPT-4 Visions. I've made two features. Paul's made like 100. And but I love the project. And it is great to see it moving forward. Well, Llama. So this is December, but it is a really useful tool. So Llama are doing a lot of stuff for making it safe to use AI. So it's part of their safety thing. So purple is from red team meets blue team in safety speak. And they have cute icons. But it is Llama Guard. So there are two things parts of this. One is a benchmark, which is essentially a way of evaluating how secure models are. Useful if you're a researcher, but this one, the Llama Guard, useful if you're a developer. Essentially, Llama Guard is a classifier where you can give it input and output, and you can start to have a classifier, is this safe or unsafe? You can start to um, give it categories for the safety and control how in, you give it in directions about how you'd like it to moderate things. It's open source, it's lightweight, and it's comparable with OpenAI's moderation API, which you're paying for, and also has all of OpenAI's decisions baked into it. And it's great to see this. So if you are building a model that you want to put like a, a classifier in front of around safety or harm, particularly if you want something which is direct for consumers to use, without a human in the loop, real good candidates to look at, and as well as the, the ones they compare themselves to. All right, Massive Text Embedding Benchmark has a new leader, and it's a Mistral derivative made by Microsoft researchers, and it has a massive sequence length, 32K tokens. So this is the amount of text you can create a single embedding for. And if you look at the other ones, it's 512, 4,000, like the previous champion was OpenAI with 8,000, it was big news when Gina made the 8,000 token as well, which was nearly as performant. But they've gone and made this monstrous model, so much larger than the others, much bigger sequence length than you can make an embedding for, and the embeddings are a lot bigger too. So it, it basically takes up a lot more space to store the embeddings. If you're working with large amounts of text, this becomes a non-trivial amount of space to store all this stuff. And it's going to be slower to run your embeddings because of the bigger model and take more hardware to run them. 
So I think it's not like, oh, people are going to be rushing out to replace their existing embeddings with this new model. But I do think 32K is something like 50 pages of text. So you can now take massive amounts of text and embed it with a whole chunk. And so I think starting to have two layers of embeddings becomes possible and interesting. If you find anyone using this model for interesting things, I'd love to hear about it. This is a fun research uh, paper where they were looking at mitigating hallucinations. And they essentially did it by probing the LLM. I love the word probing, like brain probes. But it was, they look at the internal state of different weights to say, hey, are you hallucinating or not? And they found out it was a viable strategy for it. And I mentioned this not so much for its direct practical application right now, which is often what my bias is about, but it is that I suspect researchers are going to make models hallucinate less. And so my golden rule when using my tools is only use it for stuff you can cheaply validate. If you don't speak a language and you ask it to translate into that language, you're playing with fire because you don't know if it's right. But if you ask it to make code and you can cheaply run that code or read it or validate it, really good use case. But that's because they hallucinate. That's because we can't trust their output because it's so error prone. If we can have more confidence in the models and we can start to use them for things that we can't cheaply validate, the domain of addressable areas where AI can be used just increases massively. So I do think that watching the research on hallucination reduction and other ways of trusting AI output is makes me think we will see more areas addressed by AI than currently. The rocket ship keeps going. Last one, this is from Nature. Basically, they were looking at AI assistance, making chemical research go faster, designing experiments, reading instruction manuals to learn how to use lab equipment. They had AI tools making novel experiments. And the idea that we can start to have science go better and faster because of this widespread AI, I think it becomes like another accelerator on another accelerator type thing. All right, that's what I've got this week. Codewithjv.com slash snapshot if you want to get this in your email. I'm pretty heads down on consulting things and I brought a new team member to help, but he's booked out as much as I am now. So, hey, welcome, David. Lovely to have you on board. But I'm really excited about this year. I got lots of ideas about stuff I want to build and stuff I want to launch and also bringing on an editor to help reduce the load of making these videos. Hopefully I'll have a more regular cadence this year. All right, take care.